report. Oh, there. Thank you so much. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to our March 5th session. It's March already. Oh, your students you. and your school, innovative, inclusive, and engaging practices. All right. So we wanted to share this recent post from the United States Secretary of Education, Dr. Miguel Cardona, that we saw recently, um, which highlights the relevance of the work that you are doing as apprenticeship ambassadors. So if I could have one volunteer to please unmute yourself, bring your voice into the room. And if you could read this quote out loud. And just come on off mute and read it. What if every student had a head start on a high paying, highly skilled career of their choice because their school made it possible for them to do internships alongside their classes or take hands on career connected courses? Mm. By the way, uh, secretary was here today. E.L. Haynes. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Look at that. Look at that connection being made. Did you have a chance to speak with them? No, I was with RSA. <laughs> oh, okay. Because um, I would have loved to be able to talk to him about his his this statement, this question that he asked. So, Candace, um, ooh, really yeah. quickly, as I was scrolling through Instagram today, right before this session, he posted again <laughs> today. He says, students deserve options. It's time to break down the artificial wall separating education and workforce development. So... Hmm. We're in there like swimwear. <laughs> we are in there. <laughs> okay, some changes being made here. I can hear. Um, so his question will definitely serve as our guide for the work that you that we do, um, as well as the, what you're doing as apprenticeship ambassador. So this is right on time. And in that same vein, all right. So the inaugural Youth Apprenticeship Week. I don't know if you all heard about this. So this will take place May 5th through the 11th. And we're going to drop a link so that you can have access to the site for this. Um, but this particular um, event builds off, a, off the success of National Apprenticeship Week. And it is a nationwide celebration that highlights the benefits as well as the value of registered apprenticeship program opportunities for our youth ages 16 through 24. And in this particular week, this event is an opportunity for stakeholders as well as others to host events across the country to bring awareness of the life-changing registered apprenticeship career opportunities for our youth and how they create sustainable a sustainable pipeline of skilled and diverse talent for the jobs of today and tomorrow. So I don't know if anyone has already dropped it. Yep, I think it's already in mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. oh, great, 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 great. Um, so you all can check that out and it'll also be available, of course, on our roadmap so that you can have access to that later. And so you all know who we are by now. We are your collaborative professional development team. I am Candace Heron and my colleagues are here, uh, Antoinette Sampson and Elise Montgomery. And I would also uh, like to introduce Dr. Jocelyn Logan Friend, who is the project manager of Project Expand, who will bring greetings as well as share some insights from her recent site visits. Thank you, Candace. Question, I think something's going on with the screen. It's cut off on the right-hand side. It is. I don't know why. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, something about the way it's positioned. If you are seeing something different, say, no way. <laughs> but I think it is showing up as, as cut off. But as you're doing that, I, can, I think I can start talking through it. So um, we've visited... Almost every site, I think we have a few that we had to reschedule or do a little bit after today's date, but we've visited almost all of the sites and we had such a great opportunity to build some relationships, to understand a little bit about your context um, and to brainstorm some ideas with um, about your tool. We even in some instances got to see tools and implementation. So it's really exciting. Um, I did a fair amount of visits. Uh, Lynn, who I believe is also on the call, did some visits. So it, it might be more familiar to see her face. And then also Beth joined us for one of the visits. So it's very exciting. Um, just a few themes or threads that have come out of the visits. 
a couple of things that are really frustrating folks and things are things that are frustrating people across the board. One, how do we get access to reliable reps, right? Like how do, who are they? How do we know that we're, they're reliable? Um, how many are there? Do they have enough slots for my students? How do we get, how do I get my students in this, these actual programs? Um, and then the other big, big thing that I heard over and over and over again is that there are many programs, um, either leadership or parents or just stakeholders in general, who, um, you know, I remember at the very, one of the very first sessions we had, we talked about shifting the mindset or um, shifting the perspective. And that is something that is hugely, hugely necessary. Um, like I said, with parents, with leadership, with other colleagues, um, we really need to kind of dig our heels in and figure out how we get people to think differently about apprenticeship as a viable option for our students. Um, the types of tools I, I was really so at the end of last session, we had up, you know, here's some options and you all went wild and I love it. <laughs> you all came up with all kinds of tools that solve some of these challenges that we that we find ourselves in. Um, I got lesson plans and unit plans, um, flyers and presentations that are trying to help us to shift that perspective. Um, Pre-apprenticeship skills like lists, scope and sequence, particularly for students who have autism. Um, a guide for shadowing an apprentice. So um, how do you reach out to somebody who may be in an apprenticeship program and make a request about um, a request to shadow them? So that's just a, a sample of some of those tools. Like I mentioned to most of you during the, the during our visits, we will be collecting all of those tools. Obviously today, your tool, if you have something, a version of your tool, some notes on your tool, whatever you have. If you could upload that to the tools folder, um, then that'd be great. But at the end of this program, we do want to have essentially a toolkit or a toolbox um, that we can share and then you can pull from and share with those in your community. And then there's something um, super amazing that I wrote in that third bullet that I can't see right now. <laughs> Just give us a few seconds while we try to figure out the visuals. Okay. It's still breaking off. So let me let me share. Okay. Tony, let me try to share it. Um, and then the third thing is just opportunity. So, you know, how can we what what can we do? So there are opportunities for us to share resources. We're obviously going to do that. There are opportunities for us to figure out how to build those relationships with rap providers, whether it's going to them, bringing them to these sessions, bringing them to you, but like building those relationships, getting in contact with them, asking those questions. Um I think there's something else on there, but I think that those are kind of the two big ones. We really, really want to make sure that we kind of solve for those challenges that we pulled out in that first bullet. And success stories, Jocelyn. Success <laughs> stories. Yay. Thank you, Beth. Um, we talked a lot. I had a number of people say to me, I mean, I don't know anyone who has done this and succeeded. Um, and my response to that is a couple of things. One, I think we might know more people than than what we think. But um, two, that's a huge opportunity for us. That is, it feels like low to medium hanging fruit. And I think we can make that happen and start to talk to some people, whether it's via interview, bringing them to these um, sessions, getting them to your spaces. We can figure out how we can get those people in front of you and in front of your students. Please bear with us. We're struggling just a little bit here with the visual. Now we have like a a dancing image. Okay, I think we're looking good now. Is it working? <laughs> it's working now. For a second, it was doing a little uh, sway, uh, but I think we're good to go. But anyway, but thank you so much. The visits have been um, uh, unbelievable. You all are doing some really amazing stuff. I'm gonna look forward to coming to your spaces again. Wonderful. All right. So I'm okay. hoping you all, are, I'm hoping you all are looking at, it can see that check-in, is that showing up? Team, is that showing up? This the check-in? Yes. Okay. It is. You. It's cut off it's on the cut other cut side. Cut off again. All right, probably because I'm gonna minimize your screen, maybe. Oh, we'll take it out of it. Zoom, like control. Not going on. I know what I'm sure I'm trying to look at notes and at the same time. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take some time to reflect um on our successes, our challenges, as well as any new ideas that we that we have um in the work that you are, are currently doing. And so this activity is called a rose, a thorn, and a bud. In a moment, we're going to drop a Padlet link for you all to be able to share that. So I want you to consider the work um, that you all are doing in your role as apprenticeship ambassadors. Um, 
and consider what your successes, challenges have been, as well as maybe something that you're looking forward to knowing more about or understanding more. And so we'll give you some time once that link is dropped for you to access the Padlet. And for you all to be able to um, add your thoughts. So to be able to respond on that Padlet, you want to make sure that you hit um, the plus sign so that you can respond. I'm going to try to open up the Padlet so I can show an example of that. There we go. Technology is not our friend today. No, it is not. All Ooh. right. Oh, and it looks like some people have already started um, sharing some things. So again, you're hitting the plus sign either under Rose, Thorn, or Bud and um, sharing your thoughts. We're going to give you a couple of uh, minutes to, to complete that. We have someone who's looking forward to visiting a training site so I can take pictures to show the students. Wow. Oh, good. Uh-huh. I'd love to have a person to talk to in the trades to, show, to, to, to support my knowledge. Okay. Mm, applying, so a thorn, uh, applying apprenticeships within my specific workflow. I like this, Candace, getting the support of the college team and the LEA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Students getting to learn about the options. Oh, be... I love this. Mm. Collaborating with colleagues on our vision for the tool we are creating. We did a lot of that. Really enjoy meeting with Jocelyn, Lynn, and Martha to brainstorm ideas. We came up with a lot. Site visits were awesome. Wonderful, okay. wonderful. I love this. The site visit with Lynn was energetic. Great think partner. Site visit with Dr. Tuckweiler and collaborating with my coworkers. I love, hmm. I like this one. What about the principal? My principal informed me of an initiative with apprenticeships next school year, and I have an opportunity to visit a school in Dallas next month. Ooh. It will be used as a model. Who is this? Yeah, who is talk that? To you. Isn't that great? I love this. Who is That's that? You want to tell us more? Who is that? <laughs> Maya Jefferson, H.C. Wilson High School. Yeah. So, you just read everything, so I don't have to repeat it, but um, I was doing my evaluation with my principal, and he started saying, well, I thought about you. Now, he doesn't know that I'm in this uh, apprenticeship ambassador program, and so he was like, I was thinking about you to see if you would be willing to join our XQ team. So for those of that don't know, sometimes with DCPS, XQ money is... Um, a grant that is offered to schools that are working on redesign. So a part of our redesign is to provide um, additional programming, college career support for our students. So with that in mind, since I am a manager of our NAF academies there, he shared with me, he said, well, I thought about you and wanted to know if you wanted to join our team that's going to Dallas next month in April to um, visit this school 
who does apprenticeships very well. And I said, absolutely. So I'll be going April 23rd through the 25th. You need a plus mm -hmm. one? No, <laughs> so, so now we know who we need to talk to for our May session, right? Uh, I might can write up a blurb about it, but I don't know if I can do a presentation. Oh my gosh. I love that. Love, love, love it. Okay, this was great. All right, let me go back. Thank you all so much for sharing your roses, your thorns, and your buds. We truly appreciate that. I'm going to go back to our presentation here. All righty. Okay. More, you're not gonna move for me. All right. So I just wanted to to take a moment to um, review the norms that we have. These are the same norms that we've had. We want to make sure that we know we were respecting others' ideas and thoughts. So we want to just make sure that this is a safe space, which I know it has been and will continue to be. We want to make sure that we're engaging in the work, that we're collaborating with one another, we're sharing our thoughts and ideas, and that we're all in. So if you know you need to take a little break, step away, if you, you're all adults here, so you know what you need to do, um, but we want to be all in with the work, um, be mindful of your technology um, so that you don't have any distractions as we move forward, right? And here is our mission and vision um, that we always keep at the center of the work that we do here at Project Expand. Remember that we aim to mobilize you all, educators, to help close the gap between the knowledge about apprenticeship, employment, and career opportunities for district youth and workforce needs. And we do that by, of course, partnering with and empowering DC educational professionals, facilitating the network of relationships, leveraging these extern uh, externship experiences, providing technical assistance and wraparound support, also providing disability inclusion expertise, consultation and support, and lastly, transforming you all into apprenticeship ambassadors, which you all are. We also want to keep our core practices and beliefs at the forefront of the work that we do. I'm not going to read these to you, but I will take a good 30 seconds to pause here for you all to read over them. Thank you all so much. These are our four objectives for tonight's session. We will evaluate, engage, refine, and reflect. First, we will evaluate how federal mandates, our wraps and personal experiences influence equity and access within apprenticeship programs. We will engage with our fellow ambassadors to identify strategies for enhancing equity and access for students in apprenticeship programs. We will refine the tools that you all have done such an amazing job on. We will refine those tools based on the different perspectives that we're going to hear from this evening to effectively address the unique needs of the audience in which you've selected. And lastly, we will reflect on the information that we have received during the session. Consider how it impacts your position as an apprenticeship ambassador. All right, so now we've gotten to the part where we're going to begin our work. Um, many of us have seen this picture before. We know we're not a stranger to this. Today we're talking about engaging inclusive and innovative practices. So one of the pictures that came to our mind when we thought about this is this familiar image that we have here, okay? So we're going to start by being our visual learners that we are, and we're going to caption this, okay? At this time, I'm going to put a link in the chat. And this link is going to take us to a jam board. And all I want you to do is to caption it. What does this mean to you and or society at large? So you're going to click on that link right now. We're going to take about two minutes and let's just briefly caption this picture here. What does this mean to you and or society at large?
All right. And so Candace is going to switch screens for us so that we can view our Jamboard. And really all you may want to do, if you've never used Jamboard before, it gives you an option on the left-hand toolbar to click on a sticky note. You can type on it, click save, and it'll go right to the board. So I do see some captions coming in. All right. All right. Somebody's not a stranger to this. They got the, the answer right on key, right on key. You know exactly what this thing is. I love it. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And there's two. Yes. All right. Yes, yes. I lo I'm loving this. We all got the themes here. We're all, all along the same lines as far as how, how we would caption this picture here. I love it. I'm seeing it over and over and over. Yes, yes, yes. Fair is not equal. Love this. Love this. Love this. Yes. A plus all around. Stars, gold stars, all around for everyone today. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to we're going to stop right here cuz I feel good about this. So, you guys got it. So, right, it is equality versus equity. So, really quickly, we're just going to highlight it. So, whereas equality may mean providing the same to all. So, we see on the left-hand side, everyone has the same brown box, right? Equity, which is the other side, it recognizes that we do not all start from the same place, okay? So that means in order to make sure that we get to the intended goal, we have to not only acknowledge that we don't start from the same place, but we have to do something different and do something about it and make some adjustments that are necessary so that we can all reach that intended goal and correct the imbalance that was in the first place, right? So we're going to dig a little deeper on this. Thank you all for sharing, but we're going to go a little bit deeper into this concept here, and we're going to proceed to the next slide, and we're going to add a third image to this concept. And Candice is going to, there we go, bang, boom. So we're going to add another piece to this. We're not going to just focus on equity, but now we're going to add access now. And somebody had access on the last one. So you already knew where we were going, but we really want to make sure that we hone in on not just equity, but the entire piece of equity and access. So let's talk a little bit about access. It's the ability to participate in an activity without any barriers, any restrictions, anything that society deems may put us at a disadvantage, whether it's socioeconomic, whether it's gender whether it's class, whether it's race, we're removing all of these barriers so that we have access to whatever we should be having access to free from limitation, right? So we wanna make sure that we make this connection, right? So we've been introducing apprenticeships, we've been building these tools, we've been talking about how we're making sure that our tool is fitting the people that we are serving and making sure that our students are getting exposed but we not only want to expose them, we want to make sure that there's equity and access at the center and the core of the work that we're doing with these tools. So today, when we dig a little deeper, we know that you're turning your tools in. But we want you to think about how can I refine my strategy? How can I do something a little bit different? What tweaks may I make? may I need to make in order to ensure that this equity and access is at the core of what I'm doing and that my students have an opportunity to be able to participate free from barriers. And that's really what apprenticeship programs are. They're equitable, they're accessible, and this is why we're digging in and doing this work. So today, our focus is going to be on, I'm using my hands a lot. I'm, I'm, this, this is how I talk, but sorry. So I apologize in advance. Let me put them down. So today our focus, thank you, Candace. I'm ready to proceed. Today our focus, we're going to call them tool talks, okay? And these tool talks are really going to be about how we're going to intentionally refine our strategy. We're going to learn more information. We've learned a lot of information. We've used each other. We have went back. We looked at the history. We've done so many things on apprenticeship program. And we're going to continue to get more insights and more opinions and more personal experiences that are going to help us continue to do better in this work. So today we're going to work in our breakout rooms and we're going to call these breakout rooms tool talks. You're going to work with the same person in your breakout room each time. We're going to be in there more than once. So you're going to get to know your tool talk partner very, very well today. Okay. So the first time, this first tool talk is just a brief. We're going to be in here short. This is just a chance to get to know you 
your and your tool, right? So you're going to just say, hey, I'm such and such. This is where I work. This is what I do. And this is a little bit about the tool that I have been working on in regards to the program, okay? You're going to talk about what happened during your site visit as well as then you're going to talk about, you're going to be honest with yourself and you're going to say, okay, right now I may fall here on the continuum. If I'm looking at this picture, my tool, it might be equitable, but am I really giving access or is my tool even equitable or am I just at equality, right? So you want to just, you want to just do a little self-assessment and you're going to see where your tool might lie on this continuum at this time. The goal is the more the conversations we have, the further that we'll get to the continuum so that we'll have equity and access, otherwise known as justice, okay? So we're going to go ahead and go for these breakout rooms. My great friend Candice right here is going to make this happen for us, okay? Like I said, you're going <laughs> to, in this tool talk, you're going to introduce yourself with your partner, your title of and your place of employment. And then as well, you want to talk about your tool. You also can share contact information with one another. If you want to make a friend, you should make a friend. All right. And so we're going to open these breakout rooms. They already, they've been open and they've already been moved into the room. Oh, all right. Well, talk. welcome back, everybody. Are we back? <laughs> Everyone back, Candace? I love it. You know, um, this is... This is just so very exciting. At this point in our journey, we kind of know each other. We've had an opportunity to engage with each other. We've had our um, collaboration, our connect and collaborate sessions. It just feels different and, and I love it. Um, thank you everybody and welcome back. Now, I hope you had ample time to discuss your tool and share the feedback. Um, this is an excellent opportunity just for you to um to get to get some information from somebody else to lean on somebody else to get like new information somebody hears about your tool it's brand new they have all these new ideas i love it so we're going to continue our conversation about equity and access and this evening we have elizabeth kutcher She's going to share her insights on how we might prepare our vulnerable student groups for the post-secondary option of their choice. Elizabeth, are you there? I am here, yes. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, we have a couple of questions for you. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to go back into our breakout rooms. And when we come out... We're going to have a few more questions for you. How's that? So we're going to take some questions for, from the floor. Is that okay with you? Of course. Yeah, I, I'll do my best. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So um, one concern that comes up when we're talking about students with disabilities or other vulnerable populations of students going out into the workplace is how we can keep students safe. What are some of the things that educators can do to protect students? Yeah, that's a that's a really important question. And I think um, as educators, we often feel a really deep sense of responsibility for our students. And of course, that comes up with parents and caregivers, too, who would naturally want to protect their children. Um, and obviously, we don't want to be sending students off into any dangerous situations. Um, and at the same time, um, something that we should also be considering as educators or thinking about is um, an idea of dignity of risk. Um, and I think we have a couple of resources that we can put in the chat that provide some additional um, information about dignity of risk. And some of our other participants might also have some resources or this might be familiar to you. So if you have any other resources to share, please um, feel welcome to share them. But essentially, the idea behind dignity of risk um, is that we should be giving our students the knowledge um, and tools that they need to make informed decisions for themselves, and then giving them the freedom to make those decisions themselves, even if it's not the decision that we, as the educators or their family members, would make. You know, even if we think it's it's maybe not going to work out. Um, so again, you know, not putting situ students into dangerous situations, 
but giving them tools and knowledge so that they can go out there and make informed decisions and take the risks that we are giving to other students um, their age. So again, we want to make sure that we're not setting students up to fail, but setting them up to be successful. Yeah, you know, that is um, really, really difficult because um, as parents and as educators, um, I mean, we coddle our children, we really do. And it's hard for us to kind of let go and um, allow them to make decisions for themselves. But you're right, we need to do it. We just, we absolutely must do it. Um, so what are some of the things that educators can do to set students up for success in the apprenticeship program specifically? That is a great question. Um, and I think sort of two things come to mind. Um, first, first of all, making sure that students are knowledgeable about their rights. So there are, of course, specific laws that protect workers who are under the age of 18. And the Department of Labor's Youth Rules website um, provides some really excellent resources on young workers' rights. And they have resources for educators, for caregivers, and for employers. Um, and one thing that I really liked on their website was they have some super short videos, both in English and Spanish, that feature youth talking to youth about um, their labor rights. So those could be great to share with students. Um, the website also has checklists for employers to self-assess if they're in compliance with federal labor laws um, and a toolkit for young workers that offers also a lot of additional resources, um, some of which are also in, offered in Spanish. So I think educating students about their rights is one really important way to set them up for success in apprenticeship programs. And then I think the second um, way, which hopefully is happening a little bit through, through this program, is to start to be able to cultivate relationships with um, employers or, or the, those organizations that are offering apprenticeships. Because when you have those good relationships with an employer or you know a RAP, um, when that RAP sees that you're committed to preparing students who are gonna be making meaningful contributions, to their organization, um, they're going to be, those employers, those reps are going to be more invested in helping to make sure that your students are successful as well. You know, I like to hear that there are actually um, tools for the students, for parents, for employers, because I know that um, we've had lots of conversations about that. How do we, how do we then support the employers who unlike, unlike teachers are not aware of the types of accommodations that some of our students might have and how to accommodate the student. So it's really nice to have, nice to know that they have those types of um, supports out there for, for, um, for everyone. Um, so I know that in our Connect and Collaborate sessions, I know three times we talked about disclosure. Three times we talked about disclosure. How, how do students disclose? When do they disclose? I mean, do we teach them how? I mean, what, what can we, how can we support our students? When do they disclose? Help us with this, Elizabeth. Oh my gosh, I wish I had like, you know, an easy answer. Do you have the magic wand? <laughs> I, do, I do not have a magic wand or the magic, the magic answer. Um, and, you know, I wish, I really wish that we didn't have to have this tricky conversation because that would mean that disability was just accepted. Um, and, right. you know, the, the reason that disclosure is so hard is because of all of that stigma that that exists um, around disability. And so ideally we would live in a world where <clears throat> disclosing a disability wouldn't be a big deal, but but unfortunately that's not the case. So of course there are lots of factors to consider um, when we're thinking about disclosure. Some people with disabilities try to avoid disclosing for as long as possible, um, you know, until potentially they might know that they're going to require an accommodation because they're worried about those negative consequences 
um, that might happen when they disclose. Other people say, you know, well, if if an organization is going, if there are going to be negative consequences to me disclosing, then I probably don't want to work for that organization anyway. So I may, I'd, I'd rather just know up front. Um, so, you know, that's another approach. But at the same time, of course, if you have bills to pay and you're not getting a job because you're disclosing, then that's also um, a huge problem, which of course goes back to knowing your rights. Um, but unfortunately, you know, isn't necessarily going to be enough to change that reality. So going back to that idea of dignity of risk, right. um, it's important that we provide our students with the knowledge to make those informed decisions about when to disclose, who to disclose to. And so one resource that can help um, with this, with these conversations, is the Department of Labor put together a workbook. It's called the 411 on Disability Disclosure. Um, and it helps students consider questions like, should I disclose? Who should I disclose to? When should I disclose? How much should I disclose? Um, and it covers a couple of different settings as well. Um, and there is another, I, I don't have the link readily available, but they they have a companion. The, the workbook that's in the chat right now is for students. They, there's a companion also for um, educators and parents. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's, a, there's also a resource on the Department of Labor's webpage on youth disclosure in the workplace. So, you know, those at least hopefully give people sort of a starting point for how they might be able to work with um, youth in, in terms of considering how and when to disclose. Thank you so much. You know, we we um, we talk to our students about resumes. We help them with resume writing. We help them with interviews. And I suppose this is something that we might need to add to the list, you know, and that, that would be an awesome tool just to teach them how to disclose. Excellent. So listen, we dropped a link of all the resources, we really appreciate you, Elizabeth. I think what we're gonna do is we're going to go into our breakout rooms. So we're gonna go into our breakout rooms and we're gonna think about this question. How might you integrate insights from Elizabeth to, to refine your tool to ensure equity and access for students in apprenticeship programs. So how might you integrate insights from Elizabeth's talk to refine your tool to ensure equity and access for students in apprenticeship programs? Now we're gonna go back into those same breakout rooms, into the same breakout rooms. I want you also to think about the things that Elizabeth said and see if you have any additional questions for her. We'll pose those questions when you come out of your breakout rooms. Enjoy your time together. And thanks again, Elizabeth. All right, I think we have some people that- The Collaborative Conversation Tool Talk. Yes. Hey, everybody. Hello. Hello. This is, my, this is my thing for today. Hello. My grandmother used to do that. Hi, everybody. So we're going to do something that we don't normally do. Um, this is like one of those days. First of all, we don't normally give that you that much time in your breakout rooms, but we're excited that we have time today. And we rarely ask people to come off mic and chat with us, but we would like to bring some other voices into this space. So, um, Elizabeth, are you ready? I am ready. Um, oh, and, my gosh. And, and, and I, and I love that. I love it. So, can I just question? Sorry, as you, this tool talk question was How might you integrate insights from Elizabeth's presentation or her talk to refine your tool to ensure equity and access for students in apprenticeship program? I would love for someone to come off mic and tell us what you talked about in that room. So in my group, 
Um, we kind of came to consensus that this is would be kind of a separate tool um, we're doing because first we were giving like, what is an apprenticeship? What does this look like? And then it might turn into something like um, kids would do a jigsaw puzzle and then they would get different scenarios um, based off of the readings and like different things that we selected. Um, but I don't know that it would necessarily integrate into like going to like what is an apprenticeship and what does that look like, but definitely a very clear next step of something to teach. I love that. I love that. And it looks like you're making like more work for yourself. Why not? An additional <laughs> tool. <laughs> oh, oh, Peyton is the one. Okay. But I she love it. Tools. <laughs> um, Elizabeth. I think I interrupted you. There was something that you wanted to say. Oh, I was I was just going to mention that in the breakout room that I was in, we had an excellent example of um, dignity of risk happening with a with a student. So I don't know if um, the two, if if Maya or Lindsay would like to. I'm putting you on the spot. I'm sorry. <laughs> would just like to share their story. I thought it was a good example um, of what that might look like in action. Okay, thanks. Thanks for putting us out there. <laughs> um, so I was mentioning, so I work um, really closely with Lindsay. Um, she's our DCPS Career Bridge um, coordinator. And so as a NAV um, leader at our school, um, we offer internships to our students and so does Career Bridge. So I was um, sharing with Lindsay that I was so proud to know that one of the students that she just offered um, an internship, um, he did an internship with me last summer. And initially I was nervous about this particular student's ability to navigate through um, the Metro to um, attending mm -hmm. his internship every single day. Um, but I initially, you know, I was communicating with the supervisor, calling his mom. Mom is like, he's good. He's on the Metro. It was out Arlington, Virginia at, um, not Amazon, Microsoft. And um, so I did a site visit. I go to the site visit. He's there. He's rocking and rolling. No problems. So I was just sharing with Lindsay, like, it's good to see that this particular student was, um, in spite of my fears, because I was putting my fears on him, projecting on him, uh, and he he had no issues. So that's mm -hmm. that was the story. And I just echoed on top of Maya that with me working with the student, I had the exact same fears and sentiments that she did. But then it's just kind of like a domino effect where we have host employers who are really great with these students. So they end up removing those fears from us and thinking and knowing that the student will succeed there. And so hearing Maya say this, any other additional fears I had that may not have gotten away from me are like completely gone knowing that I do think he'll succeed in this program. And the other thing is that you have, it's what you've been doing all this time is setting them up for success. This is what you've been doing. And so sometimes I think we forget that, that we work awfully hard with these kids. So that sounds awfully amazing. So, so they can do it, they can do it. So we're going to move. Let's move. Uh, so let, let me, before I do that, one more thing I, I promised. Is there anyone who has a question for Elizabeth that we have not had an opportunity to answer? Jocelyn, are you raising your hand? I'm raising my hand. Oh, um, <laughs> I have two things. One is what a question for Elizabeth. Only one. Um, Fine, only one. Okay, um, one of the things that came up that I thought was so incredible, um, Vita mentioned in our group, oh, this idea of a warm handoff. And I loved, loved, loved that term. Um, just in, rather than saying, hey, let's apply for this and you know, good luck, I wish you the best, but building those relationships and then giving an actual warm handoff. I wonder, Elizabeth, if you had any, particularly for our students with disabilities, if you had any insights on how we might be able to prepare our students um, and or the RAP providers for something like a warm handoff. That is a great question. And I think, I mean, one way to help sort of support and build into that warm handoff is um, doing even 
informational interviews with potential employers or RAP providers. So, you know, not, not as in like, I want to place a student there tomorrow, but I'm just interested in getting to know more about your program and sort of learning more about um, how they work um, with their employees or with their apprentices, what the program's about. Um, and, you know, and getting getting a feel for how they work with um, employees with disabilities or how they, if, if they have before and, and sort of, again, having sort of a low stakes conversation in the beginning to, to get to know them and then sort of building that relationship from there so that by the time you're approaching that um, wrap about potentially um, having a student apply to that program, you, you know them, you already know that they're going to be supportive or if, or if initially during that initial conversation, maybe they weren't, maybe you've had a couple more conversations where you've shared some of the resources from the Department of Labor website and sort of you've set, you've built a relationship with them where they're now willing to, um, you know, work with you and, and work with that student. Um, and, and you see it as being a potentially a successful um, opportunity for that student. So I think, I think it's more of the like building upfront um, mm -hmm. before you, before that handoff happens, if that makes sense. It does. Thank you. Elizabeth, I think we're going to like put you in our back pocket because we were just like, and, um, is it okay? And I guess I'm going to ask for everyone. Is it okay if we take your, your email address and if we have any questions, then we can, um, yes, send them I to can you. Put it in the chat. You guys like Absolutely. to have that. Okay, thank you so much. So thank you, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, everybody. I think Elise. we have one more hand up, I believe. One other hand, or we want to take Yes, it, it was me. It was Benika. Oh. I did have my hand up. Just really quickly, as I work with uh the younger uh high schoolers, I work with 10th graders. I'm in that mindset doesn't tend to be as mature as juniors and seniors, but if you can just give possibly maybe like some strategies we can do because the brush is so broad when we talk about specialized instruction and we talk about classifications, like how can we start to teach our kids to have those uh, un seemingly uncomfortable conversations because they're un unsure, but something that to support them um, as they grow with um, regards to speaking about the disabilities and not being ashamed. So can you just suggest yeah, like that's... quick strategies we could possibly... <clears throat> Yeah, I think I think that anything you can do, it's a great question, and probably we could have a we can have a longer conversation about this so, so, off, offline. But I think that um, anything that you can do to help students gain um, a bad, an understanding of their disability, I think a lot of students um, I've you know worked with well, I've worked with teachers who have said you know my students come to me and they don't even know that they have a disability or they can't tell me very much about their disability, so providing students with um, that language and understanding of like what it is um, and trying, you know, looking for role models with disabilities. So trying to find ways to break down some of that stigma. We, we know that there are a lot of really successful people in the world who have disabilities. And so, you know, maybe a, an opportunity to learn about some of those people. Oh, this person has the same disability that I do and look at the things that they're doing um, so that they can start to see disability as, you know, a part of their identity that um, they they don't need to be ashamed of. And of course, that's, like you said, a process. It's not something that is going to happen in one lesson, but um, that's sort of potentially a starting point um, because you're right. If you feel uncomfortable or ashamed, you're not going to want to disclose. Um, you're only going to disclose if you have to, um, right? So. And can I, I'm, Tony, I know I'm messing up your schedule, but Benika is one of my old student, old vintage Benika. You're not old, but vintage <laughs> from, from the years behind. You know what I'm going to say too, Benika, just to piggyback on everything Elizabeth said, which is amazing. You know what I'm going to say. You know, they're going to come to you and they can tell you everything they can't do. And you're just going to push them constantly to be like, oh, and also you have all these strengths, right? So yes, you may struggle with these things. Yes. These may be challenges. What are the things you're amazing at? Just always prodding that strengths focus as well. Um, it's very easy 
for us to hear disability and think about challenges. Um, but I promise you, every single student identified with disability has extraordinary strengths, and they need to be, you know, reminded and given space for their to to voice those strengths and identify them. As Elizabeth was saying, it becomes integrated as part of their identity. Um, but you already knew I was going to say that, Benika. You've heard me for a few years now. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I love everything about this conversation. You know, um, it's just, it just becomes so important as we move forward and as we kind of release our young ones into the work world, you know, it is, um, it's a scary time, but it is certainly an exciting time. And it's so amazing to have the resources um, available to us to support them. Remember that they are available in the roadmap. We are going to continue and thank you all so very much. All right. Thank you, Tony. Thank you for sharing. Thank you everyone for your um, opportunity and just the space to be able to have these conversations. Um, and it's really, we're just really talking about shifting from de deficit thinking and really just building our own counter narrative yeah. with all of this conversation, everything that we've been doing. So this just really warms my heart. And I really hope that we continue um, to keep this same fervency and fire as we just continue to work through these processes together um, to ensure that we are giving our students the very best that they deserve. So I love all of this. Um, I hate to end this, friends, but we have come to the end. So we're going to make sure that we want to bring it all together. And we're going to just do a tool talk takeaway exit slip. OK, and so we're going to just share one takeaway. What are we going to do now, now that we've had this discussion, and this dialogue, we've already talked about, some of us have said, well, now you're leading me to a brand new tool. You're giving me more work to do. But what are some other things that we could do and take away as a result of today's session with your tool talks, with your colleagues, with Elizabeth, with one another? I think today was just a great session of dialogue and listening and communication and just active listening and participation and engagement. So we're going to click on that link in the chat, and we're just going to share one takeaway before we get ready to go. Just one. And Candice, if you are able to click on that link for us so that we can see how you can share your takeaway. Oh, I love it. I love it. We already have ideas popping. Yes, I love this. So yes, further dissecting how my tool can be more accessible. I love this, right? We're in a constant, we, we talk about our tool should be in continuous improvement and continually changing based upon what our students need. We love this. Yes. Center equity. Yes. The value of thinking about equity and accessibility. Yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. Excited to share all of these tools. We're excited that we're going to have a repository of different tools that we can share with one another. This is a great idea. I love this as well. Yes, adding some visuals. Yes, mm -hmm. clear directions. We love this. We love this. This is really beautiful. what we do. <laughs> this is what we do. We make sure that we reflect mm -hmm. and we, we demonstrate flexibility and responsiveness. We reflect and we respond. Love it, love it. Beautiful. Excellent. Yes, these are great takeaways. Thank you all for sharing. We're going to keep that in our memory bank of resources. So when we go back and we look over all of the great work that we've done, we can go back to these things and we can check ourselves and make sure we've done what we said we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'm going to transition. Jocelyn is going to wrap it up for us and give us our next steps. Jocelyn. Thanks, Elise. Um, okay, this is an exciting time, or at least I'm excited. Our next um, CPD session is not until April 30th. Um, and we also have spring break in between like now and then. So we have some time to, you know, have a good time. We are setting up your rap visits. So I know that people have been asking about the rap visits and I'm really, really excited to start sharing some dates. What we'll do is I'll share out some, um, some, uh, some dates and times, and you can just pick whatever, whichever one works for you in terms of like your availability, but also whatever you're interested in. Um, we are entering our phase of round two for our cooperative site visits. Uh, the first set of visits were just to an individual site, um, but now we're going to, um, we've figured out a way to 
create opportunities for you all to collaborate even outside of your sites. Um, so we'll be sending you some information about how we're going to set those up. We're making those groups super diverse. So we'll have people from DCPS, people from actual schools, people from adult centers, um, all working together, sharing their tools, really collaborating, um, being able to see some tools uh in practice. So we're really, really trying to be dynamic with those site visits. And I think that you'll enjoy them. So we'll send you some details about how, how those will work. And then finally, your tool, many, most, most of you have uploaded your tool to the, the name of it, to the participant tools upload folder. Um, it is due today. If you need some additional time, please take the time you need. If you can get it to us by the end of the week, that will be great because we need to be able to assign um, your hours uh, to you. So let us know if you need an extension or something. However, this is draft one. Some people may be finished and it's all final and perfect. And some people may just have some ideas on the page for your um, credit hours. I need a submission. So if it's ideas on the page and a brainstorm, that's fine. If it's completed, that's fine. This is a working progress. We have time to revise it. Um, and then the last thing is um, by April 30th, so we have these next couple of months, um, we'll have your updated tool to you should be submitted. So we want to be thinking about some of those equity prompts that you all put in terms of your takeaways, and we want to figure out how you can apply that to your tool. So first tool is due today. If you need more time, let us know that the same tool, but updated with the equity inputs due April 30th. We will send you an email with all this information and with the details, dates, et cetera, about wrap visits and cooperative site visits. See you soon. All right. Not yet. <laughs> Can't send them off yet, Jocelyn. No way. Okay. okay. We want to make sure that you complete this session survey before you exit. We always value and appreciate your feedback. It makes us better as a CPD team. We always aim to improve and give you the absolute best because that's what you deserve. So please, please, please click on that link before you exit and give us your feedback. And now, Jocelyn, you can go ahead and say it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> see you soon. <laughs> oh, wait. Let's see if my thing will give me balloons. Bye. <laughs> Have a great <laughs> evening. <laughs>